Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Across the Broken Stars, and I'm joined by my fellow writers, starting with Michael R. Fletcher. Hi, I'm Michael R. Fletcher, and slightly more awake now, author of The Obsidian Path Trilogy and some other shit. Rob J. Hayes. Hello, I'm Rob J. Hayes, author of uh, the War Eternal series. And Titan and, Hoppers. And Titan Hoppers, which Titan has just Hoppers. recently come out. Yes. And Dirk Ashton. I am Dirk Ashton, author of the Paternus Trilogy and currently under deadline that is approaching fast like a train in a tunnel ready to crush me on a project called Kraken Rider Z. And we are joined again by Mike Carey, comic book and novel writer extraordinaire. Mike, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good to be back. So. At the end of the last episode, we mentioned that we're going to continue on with our discussion uh, about writing comics and graphic novels, sort of leaning towards advice for writers who want to try doing that. But before we get into that, um, we'd love if you could just talk a little bit about your most recent project. Uh, Right. Well, the most recent thing I've had published was the the, the Rampart trilogy, which is a a trilogy of post-apocalyptic novels set uh, about two or three hundred years in the future after climate breakdown um, uh, and after uh, repeated very, very bad, uh, badly thought through scientific interventions to try to prevent climate breakdown. So Coley, who is the main character, there they go, um, it lives in a world which is sort of living with the, with the after effects, both of um, climate breakdown and of these, these um, genetic and technological um, tinkerings. Uh, most most uh, life forms have become feral, uh, including trees. Trees feed on people now. Um, it's, it's in some ways a post-apocalyptic huckleberry fin. Is the best way of describing it. <laughs> that is a and cool the, pitch. The first book is The Book of Coley, K O L I, in case you're just listening instead of looking at me wave them around in front of the camera. <laughs> awesome. Um, it's awesome. Sweet. That sounds sick. The idea of a book with trees that are eating people, that, that's good. What's um, your next project, Mike? Yeah. Um, so I'm working on. I've written, I've written a, a sort of um, a fantasy novel, which is kind of the Magnificent Seven. If the Magnificent Seven were dead, um, <laughs> zombies, zombies, ghosts, seven zombies, yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, zombies, ghosts, and other kind of um, post-human life forms. Um, cool. And I've, I'm also working on a big, um, a, a sort of sci-fi epic, which is about uh, dimension, dimension travelers and. Um, uh, an enormous uh, interstellar empire, which is sorry, not interstellar, uh, interplanetary empire, but all the planets are Earth. They're just alternate Earths. There are thousands and thousands of Earths that have come together to 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 make a, a, a super political entity. Cool. That sounds are, the, sick. are these are these spec'd or are these are these specs or are these contracted? They're contracted at uh, a little, little brown. That's all bit. Awesome. Nice. Both and do you have series. the titles for those, or are they still uh, at yeah. a stage where there's no title? So the, uh, the 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 second one is called Infinity Gate. Um, the uh, the Magnificent Seven one. I, I I have a working title for it, which is I will tell you seven. But um, I'm not sure whether that's going to go through or not. Nice. Cool. That is really cool. Um, yeah. So Mike, uh, we were kind of mentioning that in the last episode. I think Rob, you were the one. Sorry, Dirk, you were the one with the question about uh, if a writer was wanting to. Think about adapting a novel into a comic. Like, what advice would you would you give for them? Is that the correct question? That you Where were would we start? Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. if you had a trilogy or just a novel, you wanted to turn it into a into comics or a graphic novel. Where would you even? What what advice would you give? I think there are some things that I mean, you you you're going to stand or fall by your artist. You need to find an artist who will work with you on it. And uh, the first hurdle that you're going to face is that unless you're with an established publisher, um, either one of the big two or a sort of big second tier publisher, then um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be diff- difficult for the artist to do the work without a page rate of some kind. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's 
um, it's a hard fact of life that a script that takes um, the writer maybe uh, three, four days or a week at most could take the artist two months. Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's just a, a completely asymmetrical um, workload. So finding an artist is is your biggest issue unless you're approaching a publisher directly with your pitch. Um, DC and Marvel traditionally have um, have been sort of receptive to people, you know, people like yourselves who have, have proved their um, their bona fides in another field, are published, uh, you know, published either in prose or published in some other some other format. They they've been receptive to taking um, taking those people on to write comic series. I, I I have a feeling, which is based on based largely on anecdotal evidence that that is getting harder that Mm -hmm. uh these these days they um they prefer you to have a a comics track record um before they will uh before they will take you in but i mean the good news is there are many many more indie publishers now than than there were say 10 or 15 years ago and many of them are flourishing it's a much more diverse publishing landscape and of course you've also got uh online uh conduits to to, to use. I mean, in terms of the technical process of writing a comic, I think I, I, I feel I feel this is a general a general thing. You cannot write what you don't read. There's no there's no <clears> point <throat> there's no point writing no point writing a comics adaptation if you do not avidly read comics. You because mm-hmm. because any I think any medium and any genre is a conversation, and you need to be in the conversation. You 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 need to be aware of what's been done before. What are the most exciting things that are being done now? Not because you want to copy them, but because you need to you need to be in that sort of creative creative ferment. So you start if you don't read comics, you start by like d- doing the homework, reading lots and lots of comics, um, and thinking about what you like and why you like it, what works and what doesn't work for you. And I think also get hold of some actual comic scripts. Look at what look at what other practitioners are doing. Again, not How because you will nest. Yeah, not because you'll necessarily do it the same way. Because I think there's, um, un- unlike screenwriting, I think comic scripting, there are as many ways of doing it as there are comics writers. Everybody's got their own their own foibles, and nobody picks picks you up on it. You know, if you if you format dialogue in your own weird way, or if you um, if you write a um, art direction for an entire page, and let the artist choose how to break it up into panels, there's there's lots of ways of doing it. But but look at how other people have done it, so that you you give yourself options, you give yourself um, uh, a sense of what's in the toolbox. That's awesome. awesome. How yeah, you... the, uh, the, I'm always terrified by the idea. Sorry, Jed. Uh, no, no, you go. I'm I'm always terrified because you know, say you have these books. It's like you can't. It's like a movie. You can't put it all in the story, yes. and you have to tell it in a whole lot fewer words. Um, just and just and, I and guess fact, you... I, I think I that idea. I hadn't even thought this is really dumb, but I hadn't even thought of the idea of actually getting a hold of some comic scripts i'm sure you can find them online these these days it's very it's it. very easy yeah these days it's very easy to find them a lot of writers uh, publish their scripts um a lot of the um collect collections have scripts as value added features at the back so it's, so it's very easy the the other thing though is picking up on what you just said Dirk, is that um it's very easy going from prose into comics to to make the mistake of Putting the words first, um, and in comics, comics is comics is a very visual medium. Um, when I, when I was doing the screenplay for Girl with All the Gifts, the director um, Colin McCarthy gave me some really really valuable advice, which I think works for comics as well. Uh, which is treat the words as a last resort. Use the mm. words for the things that you things that you can't do visually, which is one reason why I do those stupid little pictures before I go to script. I, I, I do the pictures first, so I have a sense of what the visual flow of the page is, what the visual sequence is, and then I fit the words to that. It's like fitting lyrics to a tune. Yeah, it's like what? Okay, here, here, here is how I picture it. What words do I really have to have? Yep. Even within writing a novel, I think that's good advice because quite often some of the most powerful scenes that you will read in a book are the ones where there is very little dialogue and you really get to understand the depths of a character through the kind of way that they are looking at a landscape or you know some sort of interesting visual motif. 
And sometimes yeah. it's a lot weaker if you just have a character talking about how they feel sad or whatever. Sometimes it's a lot more powerful if you actually dramatize that scene through action. So that's a really good bit of advice. What are some other... Um, oh, sorry, you keep going. Uh, no, I was just going to say, um, I was on a panel with Chris Golden in at San Diego way, way back, like uh, probably about 10 or 12 years ago now. And he, he said, um, every medium has one, at least one unique selling point. Every medium has one thing, maybe a couple of things that it does better than other media do. Mm. And I think with, uh, with novels, no novels do interiority. They, yes. they're perfect, perfect for giving you a character's thoughts and feelings for, for, for allowing you access to the inside of someone's headspace. Um, movies are obviously great for, um, for action and world building. And I think, I think with comics, one, one of the extraordinary things about comics is that, um, both the words and the action are coming to you through the same through the sen same sense. You're 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 reading the words and you're seeing the images. And so the, the weirdly um, everything is everything is spatialized. Everything is sort of like thrown out before you in one kind of scheme, one tapestry. Um, I think it was I think um, uh, uh, McC uh, Scott McCloud in Understanding mm. Comics makes mm. the point that time time becomes space. In yeah. comics, you know that 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 yeah. um, it, it you're 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 seeing a timeline as you read. But I think yeah, if you guys if you guys have is... go ahead, Mike. Sorry, no, go after you, Jack. I was just going to say if you guys haven't read Scott McCloud's, he's got two two books. One is Understanding, and one is um, Reinventing. Reinventing, I think. Yeah, and he talks about yeah. uh, comics in terms of semiotics, and they're brilliant. Um, they they helped me a lot when I was writing screenplays, and uh, and uh, I think have stuck with me ever since. I I still pick them up and look at them pretty yeah. often because they're just well, they're just wonderful, fun reads too. You know, the, f the first one. What are the names of those books again? Is... I'll put those in the show notes. Scott McCloud, and, um, Understanding Comics. I think there's actually there might, be, there might actually be three. I think it's like Understanding Comics, Creating Comics, and Reinventing Comics. Got it. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, I'll put yeah, it yeah, down the show. Yeah, list. yeah. Awesome. Mike, what are some of the other bits of advice that you would give to someone who, who really wants to write comics and is just starting out? Oh, other, other advice. That's um, a big one. <laughs> yeah, beyond sort of like read, read as much as you possibly can, um, read critically and, and think about what you're reading, think about what you enjoy and why you enjoy it. Um, I think yeah, maybe <clears throat> go out go out of your comfort zone. Uh, try to read a wide range of creators. Go outside the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I think there are lots of people who consider themselves sort of like um, very comics literate, but but only sort of like um, only read stuff that DC and Marvel put out. There's 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 a ton of great stuff out there from small presses, um, and small presses will often sort of like give you um, a much wider range of storytelling approaches. Um, you know, they'll, they'll work to different conventions or make their own conventions as they go along. Um, and I think just, just, I think you've got to do it for the intrinsic pleasure. I think that's probably true for, um, for any kind of, um, any kind of writing. You've got to love it. You've got to, you, you've got to do it because it's fun because, you know, if you, if you get to do it as a career, it's absolutely marvelous. But, um, Philip Pullman, who wrote the Dark Materials trilogy, said in an interview a few years back, 5% of authors, only, only 1 in 20, actually make a living out of writing. Most, mm -hmm. people, most people who write are doing something else to, to pay the bills. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I was for 15 years before I, um, before I gave it up and, and, and wrote full time. Um, so you've got to get pleasure out of it, I think. And, and, yeah. you, should, and you should sort of steer towards that pleasure. Write, write the things that give you joy. Yeah. There are, there are traditionally published authors that a lot of people know about that have five or six books out that still have day jobs of some sort. Yeah. Um, well, I think the majority of, of midlist traditional um, published authors still have a day job as well because they simply can't earn yeah. enough to, you know, support themselves. Yeah. Uh, and almost all the, indies the writing career. do it, do it as yeah. a side. I mean, it's, so there are a few that uh, that that are able to break out and do it full time, like Mike and Rob. I was going to say we've got two of them on this. Yeah, podcast. because they're so freaking good. Um, 
Well, it, but, it helps uh, having a hell yeah. of a lot of books out, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it does. It really does. Um, especially if you if you're working for publishers that give you royalties, uh, and that's that's uh, that's something to to. Uh, I said maybe that's maybe that's not a conversation for now, but yeah, read the small print and find out what rights you're giving away when you uh, mm. when you get published, and what rights you're reserving. Yeah, yeah, that's a, if you if you if you're lucky point. enough to have an agent, yeah, you know, your your, your yeah. agent will read the contract for you and sort of tell you what to look out for. But if you don't have an agent, um, re- read read every single read every single word. Uh, try and find examples of boilerplate contracts online to compare. Mm-hmm. The one you, the one and you're being offered. I know a couple of authors who also have attorneys. They, that's what they do. They, they have yep. an agent and an attorney. Attorney gets like five percent or something. They used to anyway, and they would go through and very often find things that that agents would have let pass. Um, an attorney willing to work for a percentage. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> entertainment industry is weird now it may yeah. be higher than that now you know because agents it used to be the standard 10 percent, and i think a lot of them get a lot more than that now isn't it like yeah, 15 percent? The 15, 15 is standard is standard yeah. i think 15 is standard, now. standard it's standard now yeah in my day back in the 1930s <laughs> back in the era of back silent in film. my day <laughs> Well, actually, that's that's kind of an interesting question I'd like to ask you, Mike, is how so you've been, you know, writing comics for a very long time, like over multiple decades. And how have you seen things evolve over that time? Like, have there been any noticeable shifts or, I don't know, changes within the industry or within readers or, I don't know, I'm just curious to know how it's sort of evolved. I think, yeah, so I've, I've seen a lot of sort of like um, what felt like uh, Epoch, epoch shaking events. Um, the first of which was um, trade collections. When I when I when I first uh, started writing, trade collections were a fairly rare thing. Most comic books didn't get collected, um, and now, of course, pretty much everything becomes a trade, and a, a very very large percentage of the profits comes from the collection. Um, some books don't even get an issue by issue publication anymore. They'll be published online, issue by issue, and then only mm. the collection gets a gets a print um, uh, print release uh, so that, that 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 felt huge obviously comicsology and the uh, the, ver- the various other uh, digital streaming services that's that's been a huge change um, I go back a long way so when I started writing it was still normal for uh, writers to fax the script to, to the publisher <laughs> so you you'd, you'd, you'd yeah. have you'd have to go you'd have to go to a go to a pronto print or somewhere and feed the pages through one at a time oh and they would gosh. come out they would come out or, or, you know somewhere in dc's offices or wherever or caliber's offices um and typically not in the uh, in the room where the per- your editor lived you know the, your editor would have to go to the print room and re- and retrieve it and if you were an artist you were fedexing physical pages um a great expense, whereas now obviously it's just files. It's, uh, everything yeah. is done by files. Um, yeah, and you can communicate with uh, an artist so much more easily. A friend of mine was a storyboard artist and ended up directing like sun, uh, Saturday morning cartoons in LA, and he mo- he had to move back in the in the late nineties to Columbus um, with his wife, and uh, he uh, he they continued to have him storyboarding. Um, but he would FedEx, uh, constantly, you know, it it was just always FedEx back and forth and then talking on the phone. And now he's got this, this thing, you know, and he was working with real pen and paper. And now he's got this giant tablet where he does all his drawings on that, picks his stuff and he can have, they can go back and forth live. And That's there's sick. a screen. There's a, there are screens like what we're looking at now in the recording of this, where you can have a meeting and just go back and forth with artists and different people live while things are going. It's just, it's insane, you know. It's a different world. Yeah. I mean, an- another 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 big change is uh, media rights. You know, the the uh, the, the best selling comics now become best selling in other media. Yeah. Um, and the con- contracts have changed to reflect that. And I think publishing strategies 
have changed to reflect that. You know, there are a lot of indie publishers that um, uh, mostly do do mini series, or they'll, they'll do a handful of uh, of continuity books, and then they'll do four and four and five issue mini series, which they'll immediately be shopping to um, to production entities in Hollywood. Um, yeah. And and you'll you'll tend to see in the contract that um, although although you keep the you you may very well keep the copyright on the book. There's usually a um, a clause that says if it's developed uh, for TV or for uh, for cinema, then um, they the, the the publisher becomes a production partner in that enterprise yeah. and gets a certain uh, percentage. Share. Yeah, yeah, which is probably fifty percent. At least fifty yeah. percent. I was going to say the last. I mean, everything I hear is at least fifty percent. Very often they don't do anything to get that. It's it's a separate agent or something else. They've done nothing to to make it happen except for help make it famous in the first place, which yeah. is a big thing. And, and of course, that that's meant that um, reversions are harder to get now. It used to be that uh, if a book had been um, out of print for two years, you could request the rights revert to you. And it, it wouldn't happen automatically. There'd be a little bit of a waiting period while the publisher decided if they wanted to bring out a new edition. But it was it was relatively straightforward. Whereas now it's the exception rather than the rule. Uh, yeah. Particularly since things don't really go out of print anymore. They're usually mm. available online, if nowhere mm. else. Mike, we're coming up on time here, but uh, just one last question before we kind of wrap this one up. Uh, and thank you for your answers so far, by the way. This has been really yeah, cool. Um, it's been really good. Is is there like a particular one of your works that maybe didn't get the recognition or attention that you had hoped it would get when it first released that you really are proud of uh, and that you could maybe talk to a little bit and you know point some of your fans who maybe have read some of your more like popular or bigger stuff back to you know this other piece of work? Um, I guess I would have to go for um, My Faith in Frankie. It was a, a four-issue miniseries that I did at Vertigo. Um, if Minx had existed at the time, it would definitely have been a Minx book rather than a Vertigo book. It was, uh, it was the only time in my entire career that I've done romantic comedy. It's, uh, <laughs> it's about a, a, a young girl who, um, she has her own god, basically. There's, there's a, a god named Jerevan, and she is she is his chosen people. She is the only person who believes in him. She's the only person who worships him. Mm. And um, having your own god is great because it means that Fra Frankie's life, as she grows up, is absolutely um, feather bedded. Jerevan sure. is always there <laughs> to to make make sure no harm comes to her. Make sure she always gets the breaks. Unfortunately, that means that she's grown up incredibly selfish, shallow, vain, mm. um, self absorbed. Um, and when she hits her teens, Jerevan still carries on protecting her. But now, what he's protecting her against is boys. He, didn't, he never lets her get, <laughs> get, get through get through a date. He always sabotages her dates because he realizes <laughs> at, a cert, at a certain point he realizes that he is actually in love with her. Um, huh? And so he huh? he he inca incarnates as a mortal in order to uh, in order to to, to try and uh, become um, her boyfriend. And things go disastrously wrong. <laughs> that sounds it sounds awesome. awesome. Yeah. What's it called again? We should put that in the show. Yeah, notes. I'll put that what's in the show that, notes. What's that called again? It's called it's called My Faith in Frankie, and the art <clears throat> the art was by um Sonny Sonny Liu, uh, a Singaporean artist who is an absolute genius. Uh, the the art the art is just gorgeous. The, there's loads of flashbacks, and Sonny decided he would do the flashbacks in um, uh, newspaper com cartoon comic strip style. Uh, with, oh, with a cool. very, very, a very beautiful homage to Peanuts to Charles Schultz. It's it's gorgeous. <laughs> that <laughs> that sounds sick. fantastic. Great. Well, Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate yeah. everything you shared with us. And, yeah. uh, great, great pleasure. Yeah, thanks for uh, bearing and uh, having some patience when we had audio issues before we started recording as well. <laughs> much, much appreciated. Um, yeah, no thank you everybody for listening or watching. Uh, if you want to check out our Patreon and get access to exclusive Patreon-only episodes, you can go to uh, patreon.com forward slash Wizards Warriors Words. We've got like four bonus episodes up there that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, and either way, hope you enjoy um, our episode next week and we'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Ciao. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Cheers, guys. As we end this episode, I wanted to give a big shout out to our Patreons who have supported the show. And an extra special shout out to our legendary wizard patrons, Talon and Daniel. 
If you want to help support the show and get access to a huge library of uh, exclusive patron only episodes, go to patreon.com forward slash wizards warriors words. You can find the link in the show notes below.